Okay, so I think we, uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so just another um, reminder. Uh, yes, yeah, so everybody agreed, uh, agreed to abide by the code of conduct. Um, and then you can see all the other um, general uh, reminders for all of the sessions. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, yeah, again, uh, this session is going to be recorded um, and then the video should be posted uh, by tomorrow. And um, yeah, again, just put any questions in the Zoom chat uh, for this session. Um, and you can, um, you know, show your applause in the chat and things like that. Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. I think our first speaker is Katerina Alvarez. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Katerina. I'm a third year PhD student at University College London, and I'm happy to share our recent work on considerations for optimizing photometric classification of supernova from the Rubin Observatory. LSSD will discover at least one order of magnitude more supernova than the currently available sample. But with limited spectroscopic resources, we must rely on photometric classification of supernova. But photometric classification of supernova performance depends on the not yet finalized observing strategy. And this is the first study to analyze the impact of LSSD observing strategy on supernova classification. In order to do that, we use the transient photometric um, library SN machine and the light curves from the plastic data set, which are simulated light curves. And the training set of this data set is not representative. So we first augment it to make it more representative of the test set. Then we extract wavelet features and add additional features. Then we train the uh, machine learning classifier. Uh, next slide. Um, after doing that, we studied the classification performance for supernova with different properties within the single simulated observing strategy that's available on our data set. And we measure the performance with a precision and recall. And the closer to one, the better. The, one of the important properties of observing strategy is the season length that we encode as the light curve length. And we find that longer light curves lead to a higher performance. Another important property is the cadence of observations, which we look at by looking at the internight gap of, of observations. And we find that events with median internight gap smaller than three and a half days lead to a higher performance. And surprisingly, if an event already has a median internight gap of less than 3.5 days, uh, having a different number of internight gaps that are larger than 10 days has no impact on the uh, performance of the classification. Next slide. Please. Um, in conclusion, all these results provide guidance for further refinement of the LSSD observing strategy on this question of supernova photometric classification. And with this paper, we release the transient classification library as a machine. In a future work, we plan to investigate the dependence of classification performance, but now by looking at simulations that were performed using different observing strategies. Thank you. Hi, can I start? Yes, go ahead. Yes, question. So, hi, I'm Fabio Agosta. I work at the Inaf Astronomical Observatory of Cap di Monte. And I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this project that intend to uh, analyze the detection and classification efficiency in LST supernova survey. And doing that, using a set of observed supernova templates that are listed in the table on the right and uh, um, simulating them, uh, locating a different redshift and position through the uh, footprint of SST, applying properly uh, the K correction and uh, analyzing the uh, detections uh, of the light groups uh, uh, using the constraints of the, uh, of the LSST current strategies. Uh, all the uh, all the light curves uh, uh, was it was used to construct to, to build a, a data set of observed simulated light curves 
which uh, which can we which can we we can uh, use it, use it to um, estimate the, uh, the the detection efficiency of the uh, the number of uh, de of detected supernovae as a function of a redshifted supernova type. Uh, the constraints on the on detection is uh, uh, is on the uh, signal to noise ratio for, for each filter. Um, for the detected uh, supernova light curves, we have a light curves. Uh, we use uh, a, a given classifier. In this case, uh, in the for the first stage of the uh, of the project, we use a PSN ID um, to test uh, how knowing the, uh, the, the the type of supernovae uh, if the uh, the, classifi the, the classifier can retrieve can help us retrieve the correct uh, uh, classification on the right an example of the um, of the light template light curves, light curves that is uh, represented by the bolded line and the observed uh, light curves uh, that are the points uh, for the different filter next slide So we, um, I, I estimate for each red bin, what is the fraction of the corrected classified supernovae, and uh, uh, more importantly, the um, the fraction of misclassified supernovae for each uh, uh, for each type. Um, next steps for for this work would be the. Uh, the implementation of the supernova template. So using a, a wider uh, wider uh, that a wider set of observed supernovae, applying a, uh, also a dust extinction distribution, uh, and using uh, different classification tools to compare the performances. And because the class, the uh, detection efficiency is uh, one of the um, the most important ingredient for the um, the. The, the measure of the supernova rate. Um, one, uh, one other step uh, would be to use uh, the, uh, the estimation of the, uh, the detection efficiency from this project to uh, predict the supernova rate for the different progenitor models uh, uh, using the LSST data. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Kyle Boone. Hi, thanks. I'm Kyle Boone from the University of Washington. Um, so a common challenge for transient science is how to extract information from light curves. So to address a wide range of different science cases, we've developed a generative model of transient light curves. Uh, this is similar to the SALT-2 model that we have for type 1a supernovae, but our new model that we call Parsnip is able to describe all kinds of transients and is not just limited to type 1a supernovae. Uh, our model uses physics-enabled deep learning. What we mean by that is we use a neural network to predict the intrinsic spectral time series of each transient, and we use an explicit physics model of how light propagates through the universe and is observed on the detector. So combined, we have a neural network with an explicit physics model. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So here's some example of examples of the predictions from our model for a type 1a supernova, a type 2 supernova, and a superluminous supernova light curve when trained on an unlabeled data set of 3,000 light curves from PanStars. The light curves that I'm showing here are, were not included in the training, so these are out-of-sample predictions that you'd get if you fit this model to a brand new light curve that it never saw before. Um, our model also predicts the underlying spectral time series of each transient, and as you can see on the right, it learns the underlying spectrum of a type 1a supernova by effectively deconvolving photometry that it saw at a bunch of different redshifts. Uh, next slide, please. So this model produces a three-dimensional parameter space describing the intrinsic physics of transients. Uh, this is shown on the left, and you can see uh, all the different kinds of transients are clearly separated with different colors in this parameter space. This parameter space is independent of observing conditions, in particular, it's independent of redshifts. So if you observe the same supernova at different redshifts, you'll obtain the same location in this, in this parameter space. This is important for many Rubin science cases. And of particular interest is that we can use this to do redshift invariant photometric classification, meaning we can do photometric classification even if you have a very highly biased training set. This model significantly outperforms our previous avocado model that won the plastic challenge with 2.3 times lower false positive rates for type 1a supernova classification and stable performance across redshift. 
Uh, furthermore, because this is a generative model, you could actually also use it to do supernova cosmology directly, bypassing traditional light curve fits with, uh, that are done separate of classification. And you could actually potentially do supernova cosmology with the entire Rubin light curve data set without explicit classification. Uh, so thanks. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Rose Becerra. Hello, thank you for the space. And um, I work at the UNAM, a Mexican, and I work with Fabio de Cole, and a postdoc, and I want to present here what we can do in Mexico, because we have a very uh, big group of transients, and we are interested here in learning how the, uh, the alerts, um, the classification of the um, objects from the Vera Rubin Observatory are produced to be sure that we can uh, follow up what are more interesting for us. And we have uh, some facility, for example, Coatli, which was designed to follow up the early uh, gamma ray burst, Ratir, to, to follow up the late emission of these, uh, these transients, and Doti, uh, which we used to follow up the, uh, the electromagnetic counterparts of uh, gravitational waves. And we are interested to, to learn how, uh, how the, the signals are classified. And of course, because um, we share uh, a space, we are not in the, we are not in the same geographical zone, I know, but we can share some, some sky. Then if something is interesting, uh, we can follow up all the night with all with some of these instruments. Then uh, this is what I want to present. And if you are interested to collaborate, here is my email, and we can discuss later what is uh, what do you want to do. And that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Our last speaker will be um, Alexander Galliano. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Galliano. I'm a fourth year graduate student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And my colleagues within the desk and I have been developing a simulated LSST alert stream to be used in the Extended Astronomical Time Series Classification Challenge, or ELASTIC. ELASTIC builds on the successes of the Plastic Challenge by evaluating the performance of broker systems on an alert stream of events instead of the full phase light curves that were used in the plastic challenge. The metrics for evaluation are still in development, but the brokers should be able to store and process alerts, classify them in as much detail as is possible, and provide insights that can inform follow up using smaller instruments. There's continual feedback between us and the broker teams so that we can iterate on what should be included in the alert stream and what tasks are reasonable to expect from a broker. And the hope is that by the time of the challenge, we'll have converged somewhere in the middle and brokers will be well suited to handle the real LSST alert stream. Next slide, please. After simulating transient events using the code SNANA, we weight the properties of host galaxies they get matched to using relationships derived from previous studies. So this type 2 supernova rate model is taken from Vincenzi et al. 2020, with more events in more massive hosts, as you might expect. Further, because type 2 supernovae are the explosions of massive short-lived stars, we place the vast majority of them in active hosts instead of passive ones, using a cut on specific star formation rate. This plot roughly matches the distribution of events simulated in Vincenzi et al. 2020. But because we use the DC2 synthetic catalog, our sample pushes out to lower stellar masses and lower star formation rates as well. Next slide, please. We've combed through the literature to identify host galaxy correlations for each of the extragalactic transients in the elastic data set and encoded them into our pipeline. A few of those correlations are shown here. We're now validating these correlations and ramping up our architecture to match the data volumes of plastic version one, which contained around 3 million transients. Next slide, please. 
To construct a realistic alert stream, we're also simulating host galaxy misassociation. And in discussing the association strategy that might be adopted by LSST, we decided that it would be useful to offer brokers the opportunity to construct and validate their own association algorithms. As a result, we're now aiming to release an LSST-like truth catalog that brokers can use to manually reassociate transients in the alert stream. Stay tuned for an upcoming data release note, which provides additional information about the Elastic Challenge. Thanks. OK, thank you to all the speakers. Um, to the audience, you all can put questions uh, in the chat for the Zoom again. So far, I don't see any questions. Um, maybe just to start it off, I was wondering, um, particularly for Katerina and Fabio, um, I don't think you talked about using different filters, but I was wondering if you had looked at how the different filters affect the ability to do the classification or um, like the cadence of uh, different filters. I can start if Katerina is okay. Um, I actually I, I didn't show any uh, any analysis of this kind, but I, I actually um, analyzed what, how the um, using different filter can affect the uh, the classification uh, efficiency. And um, because going uh, further in the uh, in the red shift in, in the red shift range. Um, does not allow to detect uh, uh, many filters. Uh, it does not allow to, to detect the, the transients in uh, uh, many filters. Uh, let's say in, in this um, in this example, I, uh, I I I was mimicking mimicking yeah uh, a, a survey uh, named Sudare in which the um, the analysis was. Uh, uh, was done using the, the filter G, uh, only the three filter G, R, and I. And uh, up to the uh, redshift uh, uh, point, point 0.7, point 0.8, uh, more or less, uh, the number of filters that were available for the classification were just one for most of the, um, of the, of the templates. So um, basically, uh, this um, does not did not allow to um, to have a a very um, a very uh, you know like sure classification uh, for using PS PSNID for uh, the most of the transients at that redshift uh, I got like unknown result or misclassified. Um, can you go to my first slide, please? Thank you. Um, in the uh, augment training set and extract wavelet feature steps, I use two-dimensional Gaussian processes, which um, are two dimensions because uh, they use the time dimension and the wavelength dimension. So in fact, I'm encoding the, um, all the filters that we have available for LSSD, both when I'm generating an augmented training set and when extracting features. So the more observations we have been, uh, so although I didn't specifically tested the cadence properties in specific, uh, in specific, in each filter individually, I do use all the filters and the information provided uh, by their relationship. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I'm not still not seeing any questions in the chat, and please correct me if I'm missing something somehow. Also, if anybody um, wants to just ask a question quickly, you can raise your hand. I see Rick Kessler just did that. Rick, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. It's a Katarina. You had a bullet point about the number of observations greater than 10 days. Could you clarify what or number of internet gaps greater than 10 days? 
Can you clarify, does that mean one internite gap or many internite gaps? What does that mean? Yeah, so we can calculate the median internite gaps of the observations. But uh, just because an observation has a median internite gap of uh, 3.5 days, it can still contain an, a gap of five days, of 10 days, of 20 days. So what I was looking was, what is the effect of having, uh, like, what is the effect of having multiple of these large internet gaps of more than 10 days? And we actually found that uh, for events that already have a median internet gap smaller than 3.5 days, it doesn't, uh, the, the number of other large gaps of more than 10 days has no impact on the classification performance. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, if there are another, no other uh, raised hands or anything, I actually had another question for Kyle, Kyle Boone. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk more about the um, redshift invariance and like um, what you think allows you to have redshift invariant classification. I just didn't quite get that. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, similar to the SALT2 model for people who are familiar with that. When you fit the SALT2 model to a light curve, um, it doesn't really matter what redshifts it, it's at, you'll, you'll get the same X1 and C values, the parameters of the model that come out. And the reason for that is because you're modeling the full intrinsic SCD and basically modeling how that light's going to propagate through the universe and get observed in different filters. So you don't need to worry about things like k-corrections because they're handled automatically inside of the model with synthesized photometry. Uh, so we're just doing the exact same thing here. Um, we just swapped out that first part of SALT2, which is this linear model with the neural network so that it can model more complicated um, transients. Uh, but you have the same properties where we have these intrinsic parameters that generate this spectral time series, and then we have an explicit model of how that actually turns into the data you see on your detector. Okay, great. And I see, see Hiranya has a question. Hi, it's actually a question for Kyle as well. Um, so just to make sure I understand, uh, the, the neural network is encoding um, what exactly? Where do your training data come from? Uh, yeah, so we've trained this uh, on two separate data sets. One was on uh, the PanSTARS uh, data set that uh, Ashley Villar released of about 3,000 unlabeled light curves. Um, the other was on plastic. Uh, basically, what you're learning is to reproduce light curves. You put in light, or similar to how you train a model like SALT2, you want to build a model that can learn light curves. Uh, and the challenge is it has a small number of parameters, so it needs to actually learn some intrinsic physics in order to be able to generate those models. Um, so ultimately what we get is a three parameter model that encodes kind of the intrinsic parameter, some intrinsic parameterization of all the transients that are out there. Um, and the model learns how to rebuild light curves from that. So it's trained purely on light curve data. Okay, but is there a compression step somewhere? I'm not quite understanding how you connect these intrinsic parameters to what you learned, what the model that's been learned by the neural net. Uh, so yeah, ultimately we train this uh, using variational inference. So it looks like a variational yeah. autoencoder. Um, so I haven't shown that all here because I only have three minutes. Yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> got you, got you. Okay. Yeah, Sorry, may I ask by... one more question then? Um, in the training uh, steps, so you're just taking sorry, I think... more data. Oh. I'm sorry. It's just because we only have two more uh, two more minutes. I wanted to get let Rahul ask his question as well. Okay. Feel free to message me offline. Uh, Hi, so you mentioned something that you might not need to actually do classification and you could train cosmology, you could, you could do cosmology on the full sample of light curves. How would you build a training set of this diverse uh, transients that would be there in that light curve set? Uh, so the idea would be that you wouldn't need a photometric classification training set at all. And I will say this is a stretch goal that I've not demonstrated can be done, but I think it's something that we should think about. If you have a model like SALT2 that can fit everything, you have a model- I didn't mean classification training set, but you probably need some kind of a supervised 
cosmology distance measurement training set. That that's what I was asking about. Uh, no, you don't. The idea would be to train a model okay. like SALT2, where you just fit it to all your light curves. And you'd say, if I have two light curves that are in this location in my parameter space, I know that they should have the same underlying physics. So they should, the relative difference in brightness is a measure of the distance. Of course, for like PEG2 supernovae, there's going to be much larger scatter in the, the brightness. So you'll need to figure out how to model that. Um, but the idea would be to just fit everything simultaneously rather than trying to do this two part step where you first do classification and then try to fit everything with a model of type 1a supernovae that is not appropriate for a lot of core class supernovae. But this is a stretch goal. I will not claim that I've. Well, it's that an problem. exciting idea. I think it's, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think everybody, it's time to uh, switch rooms. So thank you everyone for attending this session. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the extra, extra galactic transient session of, of Ruben Research Bytes. Um, Bruno Sanchez and um, I are the moderators uh, for the session today. And we have another five talks that we can get started right now. Um, so, okay, so just uh, friendly reminders again, you all agreed to abide by the code of conduct. Um, and then I'll uh, let you read the rest of the reminders for yourself. Um, and then just also, uh, this session is being recorded. Um, the video is going to be posted uh, sometime tomorrow. Um, and you can put any questions in this, the chat session for this, this Zoom session, not, not in the Slack. Um, and then at the end of all of the speakers, we'll go ahead and we'll go through all of those questions. Okay, so we can go ahead and get started with our first speaker, Katerina Alvaz. Hi, my name is Katerina, and I'm a third year PhD student at University College London. And I'm happy to share our recent work on considerations for optimizing photometric classification of supernova from the Rubin Observatory. LSSD will discover at least an order of magnitude more supernova than the currently available sample. But with limited spectroscopic resources, we must rely on photometric classification. But photometric classification performance depends on the not yet decided observing strategy. And this was the first study to analyze the impact of LSST observing strategy on supernova classification. In order to do that, we use the photometric transient classification library SN machine and a data set of simulated light curves named plastic. The training set is not representative. So we first augment it to make it more representative of the test set. Then we extract wavelet features and other relevant features and train a machine learning classifier. Next slide, please. We study the classification performance for supernova with different properties within the single simulated observing strategy that is available in our data set. And we measure the performance by looking at the recall and perform and precision. And the closer to one, the better. Uh, the season length is one important factor on observing strategy. And we encode it as the light curve length. And we find looking at the first column, that longer light curves lead to a higher performance. Another important property is the cadence of observations. And we find, uh, and we find a good, uh, that the events with median internet gap smaller than three and a half days lead to a higher performance. Surprisingly, uh, if we look at the number of internet gaps larger than 10 days, in these events with median internet gap smaller than three and a half days, we find that the number of these large gaps has no impact on the performance. Next slide, please. In conclusions, these results provide guidance for further refinement of the LSST observing strategy on this question of supernova photometric classification. And with this paper, we also release the classification library SN machine. In future work, 
We plan to investigate the dependence of classification performance, but now by using uh, simulations with different observing strategies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Fabio Ragosta. Hi, I'm Fabio Ragosta. I work at the INAF Astronomical Observatory of Cabri Monte. I'm going to talk about a, a project that aims to analyze the detection, to estimate the detection and classification efficiency in an SST supernova survey. I did that, I do that uh, using a, um, a set of uh, observed supernova templates listed in the table on the right and uh, um, simulating them. Um, locating uh, in a different uh, um, redshift red range and uh, position uh, uh, through the, the LSST footprint and simulating uh, different explosion times in each position. Um, then I, I, construct, I, I build a, a, um, a database of observed uh, light curves using the uh, detection on the light curves uh, uh, allowed by the observed uh, current strategy and uh, uh, selected the observed, uh, the detected uh, light groups uh, to, uh, to estimate the uh, detection, uh, uh, detection efficiency of the, of the survey. Uh, for the detected, uh, the, de the, the selected uh, light, light groups uh, are then injected uh, in a classificator. It, uh, in this first stage of the project, uh, um, I, I chose the, the PSN ID to analyze the, um, the, the performance of the, uh, of the classificator in retrieving the, uh, correct, uh, uh, the correct type of the supernova, knowing the, uh, a priori uh, the type of the, um, of the template. Um, in the, on the right, there is a, a, an example of the, uh, of the template uh, in, uh, in, in the bold line, uh, a different color with uh, different, for the different filter, and uh, the points are the, the detected, uh, the detected the simulated uh, um, light groups. Uh, next slide. Uh, I, I estimate the, um, the, um, the, the classification efficiency for each trend shift bins comparing the uh, correctly classified the fraction of correctly classified supernovae uh, with the, the, the fraction of misclassified uh, for each type uh, of, uh, of templates of supernova templates next step are uh, implementing the supernova templates list uh, adding also the dust distinction distribution using different classification tools and uh, estimate the predicted supernova rate for each uh, for um, all the supernovae uh, progenitor models because the detection efficiency is uh, one, one important ingredient to, uh, to measure these, uh, these features. And, uh, and, and also because, and this, this uh, um, and that's all. So. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker will be Kyle Boone. Hi, I'm uh, Kyle Boone from the University of Washington. Um, so a common challenge for transient science is how do you extract information from light curves? So to address a wide range of different science cases, we've developed a generative model of transient light curves. This is similar to the SALT-2 model for type 1a supernovae, but our model is able to describe all kinds of transients, and it's not just limited to type 1a supernovae. Uh, to do this, we use something that we call physics-enabled deep learning. Uh, we have a neural network that predicts the intrinsic spectral time series of each light curve, and then we combine that with an explicit physics model of how light propagates through the universe and is observed on a detector. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, there we go. Uh, so here's some example predictions for a model for a type 1a, type 2, and superluminous supernova light curve when trained on an unlabeled data set of 3,000 light curves from pan stars. The light curves that we're showing here were not included in the training, so these are out of sample predictions or what you'd get if you were to fit this model to a brand new light curve that it had never seen before. Um, our model also predicts the underlying spectral time series for each object, and as you can see on the right, it learns the underlying spectrum of a type 1a supernova by effectively deconvolving the photometry of all light curves that it were used in the training. 
Next slide, please. So our model produces a three-dimensional parameter space that describes the intrinsic physics of transients. Uh, that's shown on the left, and you can see a bunch of different transients from the plastic data set shown in different colors uh, that are nicely separated. This parameter space is independent of observing conditions, in particular redshift, meaning that if you observe the same transient at two different redshifts, it'll be assigned the same coordinates in the parameter space. This is important for many different science cases, and of particular interest is that we can use this to do redshift invariant photometric classification. What I mean by that is we can use, do photometric classification even with highly biased training sets. Uh, this model significantly outperforms our previous avocado model that won the plastic challenge and has about a 2.3 times lower false positive rate for type 1a supernova classification and very stable performance across redshift, as you see in the plot on the right. Um, furthermore, because this is a generative model, it could also be used to do supernova cosmology using the entire Rubin light curve data set without the need for explicit classification. Um, all this work has been written up in a paper that's currently under review and hopefully will be out shortly, and we're going to make all the code public too. Thanks. Thanks. Our next speaker will be Rose Becerra. Or, sorry, Rosa Becerra. Hello. <laughs> Hello. My name is Rosa Becerra. I work at the UNAM. Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, with facilities in the Observatorio Nacional de San Pedro Martir in Mexico. And I want to present here what are our facilities, for example, Coatli, uh, what designed to observe uh, early photometry for, from gamma ray bores, and to complement this kind of studies with RATIR, which has a larger diameter in the in the mirror, and of course, more uh, sensitive. And the other facility that we designed um, uh, was DOTI to follow up the, the alert for gravitational waves. And we are very interested uh, to, to learn how these signals that the Vera Rubin Observatory are producing to to know if we are able to contribute in some way uh, the science that you are developing, uh, just be sure that we are uh, that we can follow up some interesting objects that you, or maybe I don't know, um, uh, um, uh, contribute with the classification and. Of course, uh, we are not in the same geographical zone, but we are uh, at the same uh, time zone. Then we are able to to follow up some of your uh, of your areas. And in Mexico, we have a a large group interested in transient objects, especially in gamma ray bores, not only in observation but also in uh, numerical simulation. Then, if you're interested to collaborate in some way, please. Here are my. Uh, here is my email. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Rosa. The next speaker will be Alex Galliano. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Galliano. I'm a fourth-year graduate student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And my colleagues within the desk and I have been simulating a realistic LSST alert stream to be used in the Extended Astronomical Time Series Classification Challenge, or ELASTIC. ELASTIC builds on the successes of the Plastic Challenge by evaluating the performance of broker systems on an alert stream of events instead of the full phase light curves that were used in plastic, and also by encoding physical correlations that were not used in plastic. The metrics for evaluation are still in development, but the brokers should nominally be able to store and process alerts, classify them in as much detail as possible, and provide insights that can inform follow-up on smaller instruments. There's continual feedback between us and the broker teams so that we can iterate on what should be included in the alert stream and what tasks are reasonable to expect from a broker. And the hope is that by the time of the challenge, will have converged somewhere in the middle and brokers will be well suited to handle the real LSST alert stream. Next slide, please. After simulating transient events using the code SNANA, 
we weight the properties of host galaxies that they get matched to using relationships derived from previous studies. Our type two supernova rate model is taken from Vincenzi et al. 2020 with more events in more massive hosts, as you might expect. Further, because type two supernovae are the explosions of massive short-lived stars, we place the vast majority of them in active hosts instead of passive ones with a cut on specific star formation rate. This plot roughly matches the distribution of events simulated in Vincenzi et al. 2020, but because we use the DC2 synthetic catalog, our sample pushes out to lower stellar masses and star formation rates than their sample. Next slide, please. We've combed through the literature to identify host galaxy correlations for each of the extragalactic transients in the elastic data set and encoded them into our pipeline. And a few of those correlations are shown here. We're now validating these correlations and ramping up our architecture to match the data volumes of plastic version one, which contained around 3 million transients in total. Next slide, please. To construct a realistic alert stream, we're also simulating host galaxy misassociations. And in discussing the association strategy that might be adopted by LSST, we decided that it would be useful to offer brokers the opportunity to construct and validate their own association algorithms. As a result, we're now aiming to release an LSST-like galaxy catalog that brokers can use to manually reassociate transients in our simulated alert stream. Stay tuned for an upcoming data release note, which provides additional information about the challenge and the data contents. Thanks. Okay, thank you again to all the speakers. Um, we're going to go on to questions and uh, just a reminder again, you can put your questions in the Zoom chat or um, just use the raised hand feature. Um, so first we have a question from Katarina for Kyle. She says, in principle, your approach would also be useful to find new classes of events because they would cluster in different parts of the parameter space, right? Uh, yeah, so I wasn't able to talk about that in three minutes, but um, we have a paper coming out about this uh, new model, um, and we applied it to the uh, plastic data set that has these simulated new kinds of objects, and we're able to uh, basically produce a sample that is 85% all those brand new objects uh, without any particular tweaking of the model to find them. So yes, you can do that. Another application of something like this. Thanks. Okay, then we have a question from Alex Galliano. Yeah, my question is also for Kyle. Could you go to the next slide, please? Oh, uh, maybe before this slide? The spectral evolution plot. Yeah, on the right. So is the objective to show a model comparison in that parsnip works similarly to SALT2? Or is this a comparison to what could be considered, I guess, the true spectral evolution of the objects you're modeling? Uh, this, this was to show that it's learning something that actually looks like the spectrum of a type 1a supernova. So yes, in this case, we're just assuming that SALT2 is roughly true. SALT2 is trained using spectra, so it has a, a good idea of what the spectral time series of a type 1a supernova was. Um, and the really exciting thing here is that this model that we trained um, was only trained using 3,000 photometric light curves. So no spectra were used in the training. So it had to basically use photometry at different redshifts to deconvolve the spectrum, the underlying spectrum of each object. Um, and I didn't show it here, but this is the model for a type 1a supernova where we know what the underlying spectral time series is, uh, but it's also able to predict what the spectral time series of say a core collapse supernova looks like, um, even though we don't actually have very good models of that right now. Great, thanks. And then maybe a quick follow-up question. Are there any spectral features where parsnip struggles to reproduce? Uh, yeah, so we found that if you try to look at like very rare um, types of supernovae, um, especially ones that have very narrow emission lines, it struggles to figure out exactly where the emission lines are. Um, and I think that that's just a lack of information. Um, if you have a rare object and you don't have too many, you try to deconvolve it, uh, it tends to put the emission line not exactly in the right place. So you kind of get a clump of flux nearby. Um, so yeah, for type 1a supernovae, uh, especially in this data set, there's thousands of examples that so can do a pretty good job. Uh, but yeah, for more rare objects, you're going to have 
struggles just from a lack of information. Great. Um, I guess I'll also say you can see in the UV and IR it does crazy things because there's absolutely no data there to constrain the model. So it predicts something, but it's not real. Okay, I am going to ask a question for um, Alex, maybe a silly question. Um, is there any effort to like construct like what would be an unknown object, like something that new that will be discovered by LSST that might, or by Ruben that might so throw off the brokers? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and it's something that we have been actively discussing. For now, we're working on just encoding the correlations that match the uh, breakdown of classes that were represented within plastic version one. But those are all public. I mean, the plastic version one challenge, the data set is released, people are using it. And so we're also thinking about ways that I guess we can trick the, the brokers or introduce new information that they haven't seen yet. So um, right now, no active plans to add unusual objects. But if we have time after we've finished validating all of the objects that are already represented, we're going to try to add as much complexity to the data set that we might expect from the real LSSD alert stream. Okay, thanks. And then uh, Gotham had a question for Kyle. Um, can you derive the SED model from a real photometric sample of um, Supernova 1A rather than the plastic sins? 3000 is ballpark for what real samples have now. Uh, yeah, so the model that I shown was actually derived from real data. That was derived from the PanSTARS data only. So trained only on PanSTARS and not on plastic at all. So what we're showing is what you asked for. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to keep asking my own questions, so I don't see any hands up right now. Um, I have another question for Fabio, which was just that um, from, it looked like for most of the uh, supernova types or the um, transient types, there wasn't much of a trend with redshift except for the 1BCs. Do you know why that is? Yeah, basically, um, what I what I found is that the one BC are uh, the the most the, the type that suffered most for the misclassifications, and that's because uh, the 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 underrepresentative uh, representativity for the the one the one BC, and uh, no, underrepresentativity. I mean, the no, it's, it's not the cor the correct word. Um, because the the number of filter available for the uh, for the classification uh, in when the redshift uh, go deeper um, actually um, impacts uh, for the classification uh, efficiency of the uh, of the of the one BC. That's what I what I found uh, by the analysis. And also the number of points on the light curves uh, that that are you know, usable for the detect for the classification uh, is is fewer respect the the, the population of uh, of detections on light curves in the uh, in closer redshift. Sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Um, it's, yeah. Oh, it's very quiet, but if I turn off the sound, I can hear you. Oh, it's very quiet. So can you hear me now? It's better. Is that good, Trevor? That's better, yeah. OK, great. So you have, you're using the NSSD cadence strategy? And you have a detection criteria. Um, so, are you applying any sort of random decisions to select the 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 epoch, the epoch in the light curve that you detect um, in the images, or, or 
and any correlation with you know um, um, any uh, variable in the cadence strategy like seeing or emas or any other um yeah i did not an analyze directly the these correlations but um when i say it i use the the uh, the constraints for the uh using the current strategies i i meant that i i use the um the opsims metadata uh to um, to compare the uh, signal to noise ratio of the um of the of, of the of the pointing uh, with one uh, of the detection, so to uh, compare the, 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 the simulated signal to noise ratio with the threshold, uh, with a given threshold. So, if the um, to, to say if the, the light curve, the detection on the, on the light curve is uh, detected or, or not. So, the, um, the then what I used to say, if the if a light curve is detected uh, or not, is if the number of points on the uh, on the light curve is up to is is greater than ten, and if I have at least one filter um, in which I uh, I detected the light curve. Yeah, but I I I can uh, I can go deeper into analyzing analyze the correlation with the air mass and and the other features from the from the opsi metadata great thanks okay i have um just a quick question for rosa um i didn't hear if you mentioned what um if you follow up on uh, gamma ray bursts from LSST, what cadence you think you'll be able to um, continue observing them with? Is this like the light curve that you're showing? Is that like typical of what you'd expect to be able to do? For example, we gladly, we are able to observe uh, up to a limited magnitude of 80.5 or maybe 19. Uh, and the is every five seconds. And we repeat that we have a, a, a better sensitivity. We are able to, uh, to take individual frames each um, 60 seconds, depending on what uh, magnitude we are uh, looking for. But typically, we are uh, able to map this kind of light curve that is shown in the, in the frame. And for, for that, we have a two instruments, no? Because for at the first, we we want to to observe quickly seconds after the trigger, and with rapid, we complement these uh, these light curves, but with a better um, sensitivity. Okay, great. Um, so I think we're about out of time. I don't see any last question. So I think um, we can adjourn here. So thank you again to all the speakers and uh, to all the participants for, for coming.